All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Campbell with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. I'm in the Wildlife Education Division. Uh, I'm in Noburn, and you are here for a virtual salamander workshop. Um, Jeff, will, I, we'll introduce Jeff in a second, but uh, we've been doing these, uh, Jeff and I have been doing these quite a few years, I think somewhere around 20 years, and this is a new experience. Uh, normally in workshops like this, we'll do a, a short PowerPoint at the beginning of the class, and then we'll actually have collected some salamanders that we can actually look at and, and visually ID, and then spend the whole afternoon out in the field actually looking for salamanders. Well, that can't happen today, um, and that is a lot of fun if anybody's ever been salamandering, but uh, unfortunately we can't do that, uh, but I'm glad you're here. Um, uh, I'm glad everybody's present. Uh, we'll go over the rules again because we'll still have a few people coming in, Jeff, but you want to introduce yourself and then we'll mention those again. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as Mike said, uh, my name is Jeff Hall. I also work with North Carolina Wildlife. I'm in our uh, uh, Wildlife Management Division uh, in our Wildlife Diversity Program. Uh, that is basically the group that includes all the non-game species. <coughs> and I work specifically with amphibians and reptiles. And I'm in a statewide capacity. And uh, like Mike said, uh, we really like to do these in person so we can go out and look for things. And so that's why I'm in front of this nice stream here so I can just reach out and grab a salamander. No, obviously I've got a virtual background here, uh, but uh, that, would be, that would be our preference. But uh, these days and times, uh, virtual workshops are, are working relatively well also. So uh, we hope that uh, we can teach a little bit about salamanders today and certainly answer questions that folks may have and things like that as we go along the way. Okay, uh, just to reiterate, for those who are just joining us, if you don't mind, you can scroll down with your mouse and, and see a control bar there. You'll see a camera icon. If you don't mind, if you could cut your camera off, uh, your video off, that way it'll, give, it'll free up some screen space. Um, but also, you are all muted as of now. Um, as Jeff said, we'll have an opportunity to answer questions, but if we have a lot of people unmuting, you get incredible feedback. Um, but I think we've got, I think I see 62 people. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention before we get started is you should have received um, about 10 different items. I actually had forgotten one that I sent out uh, over the weekend, um, but you should have 10 different items. One that you'll notice is an article, and I'm going to share my screen, Jeff, but that's okay. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Uh, see that, Jeff? Yep, you're up. Okay. Um, uh, Jeff Bean, who is the, I think he's the curator of reptiles and amphibians with the uh, North Carolina Museum of uh, Natural Science. He did an article, I think it came out in our last issue, uh, May and June issue, and that should be included. It's a very interesting article on amphiumas. Um, the, it's amazing that uh, these things are quite common, especially in the coastal plain anyway, uh, but most people never knew they existed. But uh, it's a neat little article. We'll talk about amphiuma uh, as part of the, the salamander class. Another thing that you should have received is actually, I think there are one, two, three, four, five, six different profiles. Um, these are available on our website at ncwildlife.org, and you go under learning and under species, you actually see these. But these are the six species of salamanders that we currently have on um, on our website, and you should have each of those. It's it's a neat little thing. It's all North Carolina based. Uh, it talks about human interactions and, and habits and habitats, life expectancy. They're neat little reference items. So not only do we have, of course, salamanders, but there also there's reptiles, um, uh, other amphibians. We have mammals, birds on there. So it's a neat little uh, uh, portal to go into. But you have all of our ones with salamanders there. And I'm just pointing that out, but you should have received the green salamander, the hellbender, the marbled salamander, the Noose River water dog, and the tiger salamander. So you should have all those. Um, also, I gave you three Word documents. Um, one is the latest up-to-date list of the species of salamanders in North Carolina. And I, Jeff, I think we said 63, is that what it came out to be? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, it's in that ballpark. 
it's in that ballpark. But also it'll give you the state status, the, the federal status. And this is our species of greatest conservation need. And this is part of our wildlife action plan. Jeff, you want to touch on what that means? Because there's a lot listed under the SGCN. Yeah, so those three categories, uh, state means that whether it has a, a state listing, federal, federal listing, and then species of greatest conservation need there at the end, those are species that were formerly called priority species within our agency, and they're basically species that are featured in the North Carolina Wildlife Action Plan. If you're not familiar with that, you can do a search for NC Wildlife Action Plan, and it'll come up on our website. You can actually download the entire document. Uh, it's a fairly large document that goes through priority habitats and creatures that we are at the Wildlife Commission are striving towards conservation of. Uh, it really focuses heavily on those non-game species, and it actually directs a lot of the spending for the program that I work with. Again, wildlife diversity, all of the or much of the monies that that we spend uh, come from uh, federal grants like state wildlife grants um, and some others. Uh, Pittman Robertson Fund, some, some other types of things uh, that we can we can use for certain species. And the Wildlife Action Plan helps direct what species we might want to work on. And it's usually based on those species, again, of, of some sort of conservation need, be it that we need to learn more about them or there aren't that many of them or a variety of different uh, pieces that go into that. So those are species. You could call them focal species uh, for the agency as well. Okay. Um, another uh, Word document that you received is um, a list of families. Um, we created this many years ago because, you know, with, for instance, our, our frog and toad species in North Carolina, they all pretty much are the same. They're, all of them in North Carolina have an aquatic larval stage. They have gills. You know, they morph into adults with lungs. And with salamanders, it's completely different. There's all kinds of ways they, they, they respire. There's all kinds of ways uh, that they um, reproduce. And each family is a little bit different. So there are seven families in North Carolina. Now this, by the way, all of this right here is just North Carolina. There are other families uh, in other parts of the world and even the United States, but this is just North Carolina. So it's just a good way to, and this is how we've broken down the, the presentation into each of these families. So it's a, a little easier way to keep up with things. Um, and that's just there for your uh, viewing pleasure. And the last word document you received, Sorry, yeah, why are you pulling that next one up? We'll try not to overwhelm you with taxonomic stuff, but with salamanders, that is kind of one of the more important things. Uh, so we will uh, definitely be talking a little bit of scientific names and things like that to help us keep track of everything. But we'll try not to overwhelm you with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and the last Word document is a, a list that Jeff put together about HERP websites. First of all, um, uh, let's talk about HERP websites and what HERP means. And then, Jeff, you tell me which ones you want me to highlight. Yeah, so herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. And so a lot of times you'll hear us use the word HERPs uh, just to quickly, you know, mean both of those groups of animals. Uh, it'd be a whole different kind of workshop if we add an E in there. You know, this would be just a different, different kind of educational <laughs> workshop. <laughs> uh, <Yep>. But uh, <laughs> that's what we're talking about, herpetology. And yeah, just a couple of, uh, I'll, I'll highlight those first three there. Um, NC Park, Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. If you're not familiar with that group, you can go check it out. I help coordinate that group. Uh, Herps of NC is a website that's actually under the auspices of NC Park. And it's a really nice uh, online field guide for all the species in North Carolina. Uh, really, really uh, helpful. Uh, not not uh, doesn't have this for salamanders, of course, but it actually has um, the calls for the various uh, vocal amphibians, so frogs and toads. And then that third one there is a really nice platform for people to be able to participate in citizen science, uh, Herp Mapper. And it allows you to take a record of any species, reptile or amphibian, if as long as you get a photograph or a uh, an audio recording, and you can take a record of that animal wherever it is, whether it's in your backyard or in a park you like to visit or a trail you like to walk. And then people like me, uh, biologists like me, can actually access that data and then help make good decisions about different species and what needs to happen to them and things like that. So uh, definitely encourage you to look into that if you're, if you're not familiar with it. Um, you can scroll down just a little bit, Mike. I think there's one more thing I wanted to highlight. A lot of frogs and toad stuff. 
Um, so, oh yeah, uh, the that scientific names explained is pretty interesting. If you are always wondering, you know, what does Eurycia mean or what does Plethodon mean, uh, that website uh, gives you the um, the English translation for each of these different types of words. Sometimes scientific names are Latin. Sometimes they have a Greek basis. Sometimes they have English names in them. So they're like an amalgam of different things together. So they don't always, it's not always straightforward what that name means. And then scroll a little bit more. I think there was one other thing I wanted to highlight. Um, uh, well, no, I think that's, that's probably enough. Uh, on all of those. They're all uh, good, helpful websites. Um, so if you have questions or see things later on, I tried to check all these links before our website today. This one is a little bit frog heavy. I meant to make put a little more salamanders in there, but uh, there's there's plenty of salamander stuff too, salamander relevant stuff. Okay, Mike. Okay, uh, one last thing. Uh, thank you to Mallory Henderson. She is letting people in the lobby uh, that frees Jeff and I up a little bit to, to do the presentation to answer questions. So thanks, Mallory. And once again, this is recorded. We will let uh, you know uh, when it's available on our YouTube website. Um, so keep an eye out for that. So just keep in mind that it is recorded. So Jeff, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and you can uh, take it away. Sounds good. I'm going to do so. All right. So hopefully ever you can see my screen, Mike. Yes, you're good. All right. Uh, excellent. Um, and Mike, you might check. I, I did see it looked like there was a new chat in there, so you might just be checking okay. it. Uh, just as a reminder, and Mike said this earlier, but uh, if you have a, a question about a slide that comes up, but feel free to go ahead and write that into the chat. And Mike and Mallory will both be sort of uh, monitoring that. I can't see it at all when I'm presenting, but they can, and they can uh, throw those questions uh, my, our way, and we can we can talk about them. And Mike and I are going to do this in a back and forth format, so we'll share both share information about various species. Uh, just a quick advertisement, uh, five second advertisement here. This is the program that supports the work that my agency does in my program, uh, the North Carolina Non-Game and Endangered Wildlife Fund. And if you're interested in contributing towards that, you can either uh, get your vehicle with a personalized license plate with the awesome Pine Barrens tree frog that you see there. Um, that's a relatively new uh, license plate. Uh, we got one in the driveway right outside. I mean, how could you resist that irresistible frog on there? Uh, one of our state amphibians, along with the marbled salamander, our other state amphibian. Or if you so choose, uh, you can uh, check a, a various line when you do your taxes. I think it was actually line 30 this year, even though it says 26 on there. Or you can donate directly online to our non-game fund. Uh, I do help coordinate the North Carolina Chapter of Park. If you're more interested in that, as I said before, we saw on the websites, ncpark.org. You can go there to learn more and join if you wish. And that's all I'm going to say about that today. So our diversity in North Carolina is quite uh, remarkable. 31 species of frogs and toads, one crocodilian, 21 turtles, 13 lizards, 38 snakes, and whoa, there's the whopper. 63 species of salamanders. Notice there's a plus or minus on there. It really should probably just be a plus. I don't <laughs> think we're going to lose any species of salamanders. Uh, but uh, when Mike and I, Mike mentioned we've been doing these workshops for about 20 years, and I went back and looked at some of those early ones, Mike, and we had a plus or minus 45 species of salamanders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So the field of salamanders and genetics uh, has really expanded what we understand to be the various species in this group. So anyway, 167 species in North Carolina, that's, that's pretty remarkable. But of course, we're gonna focus on our salamanders today, like this nice black belly salamander. We are gonna do a little bit of background biology uh, as, we, as we get into this. So this is your amphibian 101. So just as a reminder, uh, amphibians have smooth, slimy skins, and so salamanders are no different. Uh, sometimes people get confused between lizards and salamanders. Uh, very commonly, uh, people will call me or email me and might get the same thing. Someone will see a quote unquote salamander on the side of their house in the middle of the daytime. Uh, salamanders are not typically active in the daytime because their smooth, slimy skins would, would dry up, desiccate in the sun. 
So usually that's lizards that people see out during the day. And some, some pretty obvious differences are that um, lizards have scales, salamanders do not. Also, uh, lizards have claws at the end of their uh, toes that you can see on that fence lizard there on the left. Um, no claws on salamanders, although some of them have some interesting uh, little pieces on the ends of their little uh, calcified things on the ends of their toes. They're not really claws. And most species, I shouldn't say most species, a lot of species are gilled as larvae. Uh, we'll see that there's, as Mike alluded to already, there's, there's a lot of differences in uh, what we see from uh, various uh, salamander families. So we'll talk about that as we go along. But there are some that, that have no larval stage at all and some that stay larvae the whole time. They're basically a larva as an adult. But uh, you certainly don't have any of that. All lizards are direct developers, so when they hatch out of the egg, they look like a small version of the adult. So just a few differences between those groups. Uh, most of people think of amphibians with this sort of standard breeding uh, 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 plan. So you have your adults that show up at a breeding site, they lay eggs in a breeding wetland, those eggs hatch out when we have, uh, and we have larvae, they're free swimming, eventually, those larvae uh, trade in the gills that they have for lungs. They come out as uh, larval or juveniles here, uh, metamorphs, and then eventually they grow up to be an adult. This uh, whole slideshow here, these pictures are all of the mole salamander. Um, that's an adult and a juvenile there. Uh, actually, their egg masses don't look quite that large, so we'll don't worry about that too much. <laughs> but where we get real uh, tremendous variation is that we get some species, as I mentioned, that completely skip that larval phase and they go straight into that, they hatch out and look like juvenile versions of the adults. And then, as I mentioned, we get some that never really grow up. They're kind of like, the, I guess, the, the Peter Pan of the uh, salamander world. And they are able to retain a lot of larval characteristics, and yet they are also reproductively capable and so they look like giant larvae. Uh, sometimes they're, most of them are larger, and, uh, but they're able to, to reproduce. So lots of interesting things going on in the salamander world. Uh, so we mentioned moist. Uh, they all are able to breathe through their skin. Some of them, that is the only method that they have for, for respiration. Some have gills, some have lungs, some have both. Some can do all three. Uh, so salamanders are pretty amazing critters. Uh, they all do have a fairly uh, keen sense of smell, especially for various chemicals produced by other salamanders so that they can uh, communicate with one another uh, chemosensory wise. They eat lots of different types of invertebrates, but that key is the bottom there. Most uh, salamanders will eat anything that they can fit into their mouths. And that definitely does include other amphibians. And in, in some cases, it definitely includes other salamanders. Uh, there are a lot of species in decline. These are a couple uh, species here that are in that case, the Whirly salamander on the left and the Weller salamander on the right. And there are more amphibian species currently uh, endangered than, than birds or mammals. So there's always some, some tough things going on there that we're trying to help reverse. What are some of these reasons for decline? Well, they're, uh, they're standard ones that we see for a lot of different species of wildlife, habitat destruction being number one, and then you see those other uh, uh, bullets there. And how many of these are human caused? Uh, I would argue that to at least some degree, every single one of them is. So this is what we'd really like to do. And it's just like the background I have behind me. I forgot I had the same thing in the slideshow. Uh, this is where we think of, you know, traditionally we might say, oh yeah, that looks like a great place to look for salamanders. And it indeed is. This particular stretch of stream, I was there with some colleagues for a, an hour or so and we were able to generate this little tray of salamanders along with a whole bunch of others. But this is the kind of diversity that you might find within different types of streams. And there's actually four different species of salamanders in this tray in various stages of uh, 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 their life cycle. But uh, salamanders can certainly be found in other types of water bodies too. They're certainly in large water bodies like this, a slow moving coastal plain stream uh, they are found in uh, wetlands that periodically dry up, ephemeral ponds, and they may be ones that have almost no canopy, like this one here. There are some specialists that use this type of wetland, or others that may use the same similar type of pond, 
but in a canopy type situation. And this is what those ponds might look like when they're dry. And then there are others that don't need wetlands at all, and they might just prefer uh, some sort of mixed pine hardwood type forest like this, uh, where there's plenty of uh, logs and ground cover and places for them to exist. And then finally, uh, you may even have some specialists that really like crevices in rock walls or seepagey kinds of places where water is flowing. Um, in, in this particular case, it is flowing, but this particular little waterfall is sometimes dry, uh, but there is a little seat at the top of this. So, so this is another place, uh, sort of a micro habitat for various species of salamanders. So within this group, uh, seven different families, as Mike mentioned, about 63 species. Uh, there's lots of variation. We kind of mentioned that. Our hotspot for diversity is in the mountains, but the coastal plain actually has a lot of different species of salamanders as well. The biomass of salamanders can be quite remarkable. There was a paper a few years ago now uh, that showed that salamanders actually uh, it represented more biomass than all of the other vertebrates added together in certain places. Um, uh, this was in the mountains. It was actually done in West Virginia, that study. Uh, but that's pretty remarkable because no individual salamander is particularly large. There are a few exceptions. But in this case, they were actually talking about redback salamanders, which are a tiny little species. But there were so many of them in the forest, so many per acre and so many uh, et cetera, across the landscape that the biomass exceeded that of all other vertebrates. Many of them uh, do use different types of pheromones or chemicals to communicate with one another. So that's important. Okay, Mike, if we had any quick questions before I start into the families. Uh, no, Jeff, uh, no, you're good. good. Okay, great. Gave me a chance to get a quick sip of water. Okay. Okay. So our first family, uh, Sirenidae, these are the sirens. We have two species in North Carolina. Uh, they're both relatively large salamanders. These are some of those Peter Pan type salamanders. They never grow up. They kind of look like giant larvae. Uh, they are aquatic their entire lives. Occasionally in really heavy rains, you may see them uh, across a road or I think after a hurricane, I actually found one underneath a trash can lid on the side of the road and he was looking very forlorn and really wanting to get back to some water somewhere. Um, but uh, they do have external gills and lungs. Uh, so that's why they're able to survive on land for at least a, a period of time. Again, they would desiccate eventually, uh, but they can breathe uh, through those lungs. Their gills are external, so I'll show you those in just a second. They have front limbs, but no back limbs. Uh, sometimes this gets confusing because we talk about Another species that's similar, the Amphiuma, has four, F-O-U-R, limbs, uh, but <laughs> uh, we'll look at that in just a second. And these guys are only found in the eastern part of the state uh, in North Carolina. So this is the main species that uh, folks might uh, have an opportunity to see, the greater siren, the other is the lesser siren. Uh, very similar looking species. The lesser siren is just a little bit smaller as the greater siren is a little bit larger as their names suggest, uh, but there's overlap. You can get a small greater siren and a large lesser siren and they're, they're about the same size. Uh, there are some differences in the types of spotting that they have and the number of costal grooves, which are these lines that you can't see very well on the sides of these salamanders. Uh, as you can imagine, those are some characters that can be pretty difficult to uh, uh, assess uh, on a wriggling wet salamander. Uh, so it's kind of fun. Uh, larvae of greater siren look a lot like the adults actually in terms of, you know, they don't have rear legs, they just have front legs and they have these wonderful bushy gills that you can see on the adult, but real pretty uh, sort of red stripes on the sides, yellowy on the sides. Uh, these can be found in a wide variety of habitats, and they don't have to be particularly pristine. That larvae on the lower left corner of the screen, we actually dip netted out of the uh, water containment system for a parking lot of a, a local high school in New Bern. So <laughs> you can actually find them in, in a wide variety of systems. But you can see, uh, you know, their distribution is sort of spotty. There's not tons and tons of records of this species. I think largely that's due to people not necessarily uh, knowing how to look for them or not seeing them because of the secretive nature of their uh, biology. Uh, mostly living in slow moving seeps and swamps, 
uh, ditches and creeks, things like that. So uh, people not necessarily interacting with these all that much. One thing I'll mention about the map on the lower right, uh, Mike, um, we, we talked a little bit about maps, I think, uh, earlier. And Mike will need to remember to, to go through some field guides at some point, right, uh, just right, as right. I make a mental note about that. Um, but uh, this particular uh, map is a dot map, and it's maintained. These maps are maintained by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And each one of these dots represents an actual record that's either in, a, in our museum or in a museum somewhere in the world. The, the circles that are hollow, like there's one right there in Greene County, right there, or is that Wilson County? That's Wilson County. Uh, that particular dot uh, means that there's uh, someone has seen that animal uh, that knows what they're talking about, and it might be represented by a photograph or something like that, but there is not an actual specimen for that particular dot. These maps are different than a range map that you might see from a traditional field guide where you would probably have the whole coastal plain that would be grayed in. Um, but I think they're kind of interesting and they can help drive citizen science efforts because you might look at this map and you might say, maybe you live in Beaufort County and you see dots in Pitt County and one in Lower Craven County and here's one in Hyde County, but there aren't really any dots in Beaufort County. Does that mean the species is not found there? Well, probably not. It means that the species has not been documented there. So that means that somebody hasn't specifically gone and looked for it to try to document the animal. Uh, sometimes we see large clusters of dots closer to universities where uh, people may have graduate students that go out and do more looking for things. Uh, I suspect that's why we have so many New Hanover County records right down here. We have UNC Wilmington, uh, you know, that, that would have students going and looking for things. And so sometimes we'll see that. Uh, but, you know, if you live in one of the counties uh, that you as we go through today and, and you notice a species that you think you've seen before, you can actually document it uh, by either sending a photograph, uh, documenting that through Hurt Mapper, like we talked about uh, before um, on that uh, uh, website's page, or you can uh, send that information to me and we can potentially add a record that way. OK, any questions on the siren, Mike? No, but Jeff, this may be a good time to bring up, the, uh, are these dot maps available to the public? Yeah, good question. Uh, they actually are not. Uh, they are only maintained, as I said, by the State Museum of Natural Sciences. Um, their hope is to one day publish a uh, large book as a companion to the reptiles of North Carolina that was published in 1995, but they've never published the companion amphibians of North Carolina. Uh, there are other field guides that are out there, uh, but these dot maps are not currently available to the public. But we're looking into ways that we might be able to to do something that uh, we could create a PDF document similar to what we've done for frogs of North Carolina, also not available to the public, uh, generally speaking. Uh, so we might see what we can look and do uh, in that regard, Mike. OK, one real quick question. Uh, Chris has asked, has this map been cross referenced with Herp Mapper and Odd Naturalist? No, that's a great, great point. So uh, this map only represents specimens, again, that are in, uh, that are maintained by museums or other collections. So this is not a map that includes any Herp Mapper records or INAT records or any other citizen science platform. So that's a, that's a great point. We're actually working uh, on a couple of different sites to create some dynamic mapping that would include historical records as well as some more recent uh, data through those other platforms. So uh, that's a great point, but no, this these maps do not uh, show that. OK, moving on to a different family, Cryptobranchidae. This is uh, only one species in this group. Uh, it's a nice, big, large, handsome fellow. You can tell by the, the quarter that's sitting on the rock there. This is not a tiny salamander. Uh, there, all of the ones in North Carolina are only in Mississippi drainage uh, uh, watersheds, but there is one group that's in uh, an Atlantic drainage out of the New York area. And it is the Eastern Hellbender. Uh, this is a species of special concern in North Carolina. It's one of my favorites. Um, you'll see in some field guides, I think I read one where it said, ugly, slimy, something, 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 best describes a salamander. I thought, well, that couldn't be further from the truth. So I think beauty is in the eye of the beholder, because I think that 
these are really fascinating and super cool looking animals and they're beautiful to me they're not ugly at all uh, this species is only found in the western part of the state as you can see by those dots uh, this is one that you know we've we've got some streams where we have decent hellbender populations and then we have a lot of streams where we've seen hellbender populations dwindle uh, they suffer from a lot of things but rock moving uh, by people not meaning to do any harm, but may maybe moving rocks around in streams, things like that can be problematic uh, because these uh, those are rocks that are used by these, these animals heavily. Uh, siltation because of uh, poor agriculture practices that go maybe right down to the water's edge or development or lots of other things like that. Siltation actually causes problems for these, these uh, animals as well, just like it does for trout species that may be in the same types of streams. The family Proteidae is another one of these that still has these. Oh, by the way, hellbenders do have gills and lungs as well. So we're talking about another critter that still has a lot of these larval characteristics. Um, the Proteidae, uh, again, these guys still in that same group. So they look like larvae. We have three species in North Carolina. You can see these external gills here. Uh, they do have front and back legs in the case of, of this particular water dog that we're looking at here. Aquatic, they're all lives. They, they really can't come out of water. Uh, and yeah, some people also use the term mud puppy uh, to describe these. Not really sure where these terms come from, although there are cases where if you have one of these out of the water, they can actually kind of make an odd sound that maybe someone at one time thought sounded like a bark. I would not describe it like that at all. Uh, but also maybe these little gills look like puppy's ears or something like that. I'm not really sure. So here's one of the species from North Carolina. It's the one that was on that previous slide as well, the dwarf water dog. Uh, it probably has the widest distribution of any of the three uh, mud puppies or water dogs in North Carolina. You'll see it's in the coastal plain as well as the eastern Piedmont. It's uh, maybe, you know, five, six inches long. You may get one uh, that's maybe slightly longer than that, but generally uh, that's, that's a good uh, ballpark size range for these guys. Uh, they often have little orange or yellow markings on the gill coverings. You can kind of see these, these orange and yellow spots on their gill covers. Um, they that can be one thing that may help you distinguish them from larvae of other salamanders but generally speaking their size also helps they're generally larger than the larvae will be for most uh species of salamanders the second uh water dog that i'll mention is the noose river water dog this is another species of special concern like the eastern hellbender is uh, this one is an endemic so only found in north carolina and it's only found in two river drainages, the noose and the tar drainage that you can see uh, with by these dots. You've got the noose through here and the tar through here. Um, and so uh, that's the only places that that species is found. There is this weird record down here from the Cape Fear Basin, but we actually think that was probably a released animal from some sort of uh, weird project uh, in the 50s or 60s. But anyway, that I won't go into that too much more. These guys are really interesting. I've spent a lot of time uh, doing some surveys for these just to try to assess their status assessment. Uh, they are uh, petitioned for federal listing and they've actually been proposed for federal listing as threatened. And so um, that will be moving through the courts uh, here. And at some point uh, we may receive a federal designation for this species. Okay, any questions on the proteids, Mike? Uh, Derek, it just put down sound with a question mark. I, I'm not sure what he was asking, but uh, you mentioned uh, they can make sort of a, a, a sound um, uh, when they're out of the water. So uh, he just had sound with a question mark. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, they can make little squeaks and things like that. The sirens do that as well, by the way, some little squeaks and, and sounds. Um, but it could be that Eric is having sound issues with the the. Uh, platform. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, they do make some sounds. Yes. Uh, so the Amphiuma, Amphiuma Day, there's my famous quarter to give me some size. Uh, these guys, uh, there's only one in North Carolina, although there are three in the United States. They are aquatic their entire lives. Uh, they have tiny little front legs and back legs. That's a little tough to see in this photo, but there's one of the front legs. 
The other legs are right here, little tiny things. So it's kind of like if you pulled your arm off and stuck your finger back in the socket and put two little legs, two little toes on the end of that little leg, uh, that would be the, the limb that you would have. And they're only found in the coastal plain. And our species is the two-toed amphiuma. Uh, like you can see on this upper right, these legs are just little tiny things. And we think they're essentially, uh, you know, mostly vestigial, uh, a remnant of evolution. And at some point, they'll probably go away completely, perhaps. Uh, but for now, they do have these little bitty, uh, uh, appear useless to us, but maybe they do use them for something. Uh, just for comparison, there's actually two amphiumas in this picture on the left and the siren kind of behind it so that you can see the speckledy pattern on the body of the greater siren helping us distinguish uh, the pattern that we see on the amphiuma. Uh, the amphiuma also does not have external gills, but it does have internal gills. You can see this uh, hole here that allows water to go in and out. Uh, they also have uh, internal lungs and both amphiumas and sirens have the ability to estivate for long periods of time. So if the water body that they're living in dries up, they can actually create this little um, uh, cocoon around their bodies until that wetland fills again with water. And so it allows them to survive for long periods of drought in uh, different types of wetland situations. So pretty remarkable animals that they're, they're able to do that. Uh, amphiumas have some pretty significant teeth in their jaws. As I got the experience to uh, encounter firsthand a number of years ago, I actually received a bite from an amphiuma that you can get more details on in uh, the article from Jeff Bean. Uh, they specialize in eating crayfish, although they eat just about anything they can get their mouths on, but they eat a lot of crayfish. And some of the species that eat crayfish may wait until those crayfish have shed their skins and they're more soft shelled, but not the amphiuma. Uh, they eat them at any stage and they basically come up to them and just smash them up into a pulp with those teeth and those strong jaws. And then they just sort of suck up all the bits that are left. <laughs> and uh, when we were doing some surveys at a site in coastal North Carolina, I had one in a minotrap and uh, I was attempting to handle it and it bit me on the finger, spun around and dropped off. And um, uh, it was uh, quite, quite the bite. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that, but I'll leave it at that for now. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty remarkable animals. Generally speaking, they're they're fairly calm. Uh, the, this one, for whatever reason, uh, was not having a good day, and I didn't make it any better. <laughs> All right. Uh, at this point, I'm going to actually stop sharing, and I'm going to let Mike uh, take over for a second here. Okay, Jeff, uh, before I uh, share my screen, uh, Tara had asked uh, if they're fully aquatic, how do they use their front and hind legs? And are most of the forelimbs and hind limbs useless in salamanders? And we'll talk about that second part a little bit later, but uh, if you want to mention that first part, can you see Tara's chat now? Um, uh, I'm actually doing something else, but um, I, can, I understood the question. So, um, it depends a lot on the species. So, so sirens and certainly hellbenders and the water dogs all use their legs quite a bit. Amphiumas, we don't think use those legs really for much at all. You'll see them just kind of trailing behind them, you know, as they're swimming along doing their thing, but they don't really tend to use them particularly heavily. Um, was there another question or did I, did I kind of answer it? Um, she, she was talking about the, the other salamanders use their legs and, and we'll get to that like every salamanders we haven't talked about yet? Right. I think I oh. think that's what she was asking. Okay, yeah, most salamanders do use their legs. Uh, many species of salamanders are, we have more species of salamanders that are terrestrial than we do that are fully aquatic, at least as adults. Okay, um, can everybody see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm what just you might do is, what you might do is shrink me because I see me in the lower right. Yeah, if you just hit your, yeah, there you go. Okay, much better. Um, I was going to talk about the Ambistomatidae. These are, um, uh, I think a lot of people, when they think of salamanders, they think of these um, uh, particular species. And I just want to check something. Uh, Jeff, can you see my camera? Is it on? Uh, no, your camera's not on. Okay. All right. 
Well, I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, uh, there are five species in North Carolina. These are what a lot of people consider the mole salamanders. Um, and that could be a little confusing because I think Jeff had a picture at the beginning of a actual common name of a mole salamander. But this one is the whole group is described as mole salamanders because of their lifestyle. They spend a lot of time underground. Most people never see them unless they're actively looking for them, turning over logs, things like that. Um, so uh, that's where that mole salamander name comes from. Just the, the, the way they spend most of their time is, uh, is, is usually mole-like. And all of the uh, uh, mole salamanders are lunged as adults. Now, a neat thing about mole salamanders, uh, this family, is they have a little bit different breeding than what Jeff's talked about earlier with some of the other species. And there's even some variations within the mole salamanders, especially the time of year and how they lay their eggs. Um, but this is the, um, uh, the spotted salamander. This is one that is found um, almost completely, say, Raleigh west towards the mountains. However, there are a couple of populations in Hyde and Beaufort counties right here. Um, but this is a, a great picture. These are, um, are winter breeders. They are actually breed... Um, in the winter, maybe a, a nice warm night in, in, in February or, or certainly in March, you get uh, something triggers a mass movement for these. Um, and uh, I'm going to go back a slide. There is the picture right there of a mass movement of, of, of spotted salamanders. This was, I think, taken near Elk Park, uh, Elk Knob State Park. And sometimes on these, these uh, sort of warmish winter nights, you have this big mass movement of salamanders, this particular species. And they're all heading to a breeding pond. These are, I uh, prefer ephemeral ponds that, that seasonally dry up. Jeff showed you a picture of one of those. And they are um, usually fishless. They do not like to lay their eggs where there are um, fish in. So hence that drying out, that ephemeral part of the pond. But when they move in this mass movement like this, uh, they're, they're actually going for one purpose, and that is to reproduce. And it is actually called a Congress. Um, I will leave that as that, but uh, that's actually when they move, it's actually a Congress. But the spotted salamanders, once again, primarily found um, uh, west of Raleigh, west of the fall line. Um, and Jeff and I were talking yesterday because, you know, I, I think some of you are from Rowan County. They're certainly in Rowan County and there's a circle there, but there's no doubt they're probably in these counties. And Jeff mentioned the maps, but I wanted to mention uh, some things. A lot of you may be birders and, you know, a lot of you may eBird submit list. And, and, and we had a conversation with one of the eBird people up at Cornell last week. There's thousands of lists submitted every day by birders, uh, species lists, what they see. There's not a lot of people out looking for some of these salamanders. So I wanted to point that out. Uh, you get a lot uh, uh, more people searching for the, the nice uh, feathered friends than you do searching for these. But certainly they're more likely found in these areas right here. Um, that's as, that's uh, a great point, Mike. And I'll just, if I may, just add one other thing along the same lines is that because a lot of these species uh, of reptiles and amphibians, uh, you know, are not vocal. They're tough to run across unless you're actively, you know, searching for them. So yeah, great point. Okay, uh, but once again, the spotted salamander. Um, once again, this is a breeds late winter uh, on those warm nights. This one's a little bit different. Um, this is uh, the marbled salamander. These are found uh, primarily in the coastal plain in Piedmont. You can see a few populations down here, but these are actually a little different. These are fall breeders. And uh, during the fall, generally, uh, you'll have a reproducing male that is a lot brighter white than the uh, female. Uh, these are both adults here, but that is a male with its just the fine color breeding plumage. Not all salamanders do that. Not marbled is really, uh, really shows up as the as the uh, in their breeding plumage. Um, but unlike the 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 spotted salamander you saw earlier that laid a gelatinous egg mass in a body of water, marbled salamanders are a little bit different they actually will get on the edge of an ephemeral pond, usually a fishless pond. And actually the female, after they reproduce, the male will drop a, sp uh, a sperm packet called spermatophores. And they, she will actually pick that sp uh, sperm packet up and insert it into her cloaca. And they will lay their eggs near one of these ephemeral bodies of water in the fall. 
And you can see Jeff's got a great picture right here of a female that's actually guarding eggs. Um, it does look like a bright male there, but I have a feeling that may have been from a flash or something else. Uh, is that what you think, Jeff? It's probably not that kind of white on there. Did I lose Jeff? No, I was muted. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. typing in the chat a little couple of things. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably a little bit of flash on there, although there is. So we haven't really used this word too much, but the V word, right? You can mention That's that, right. Mike. Uh, yeah, lots of variability in these, um, uh, and and especially in some of the other species that we'll get to. But yeah, you can never say never and never say always. There's lots of variability going on. So, but generally the males are are, are brighter white during the breeding season. But the female, as you can see here, she's laid her eggs and uh, she's guarding them. But being that fall breeder, laying those eggs next to that ephemeral body of water, what generally happens to those bodies of water in the wintertime, they begin to fill up. When the water begins to fill up, the eggs will actually submerge in water and she will uh, move away and actually um, uh, just let the eggs uh, hatch on their own after they're inundated with water. I did want to mention something that we haven't talked a lot about this, but um, it's really interesting when some of these things are active. Think about um, uh, some of the movements at this time of year. I mentioned that uh, this could be a fall breeder. One of the first workshops we did about 20 years ago, uh, one of the people that came to the workshop was actually interested in seeing what he saw while he was deer hunting. Um, and he didn't know what it was. He was up in a stand and it was actually snow on the ground in November. And he saw one of these crawling across the snow. Um, and that just really floored him and never knew what these things existed. But they, like some of the, like some of our frog species, can actually tolerate very cold temperatures with, uh, they, they might, they make uh, glycol and glycogen in their blood, sort of like an antifreeze. And they're actually active when it's a little bit cooler. Uh, maybe that's to avoid predation and desiccation, but these things, unlike when we talk about ectothermic animals like like snakes and turtles and things, you know, they rarely come out uh, unless it's nice and nice and warm. But uh, some of our salamanders are completely different. Any questions about that, Jeff? And I'm having a problem with my camera. I'll cut that on in just a second. Uh, no, we're, we're good, Mike. Answering a couple of things here in the chat. Uh, but uh, yeah, you keep rolling. Okay. Now, the largest mole salamander is the tiger salamander. Uh, this is one that's listed as threatened. Uh, it's our largest mole salamander, as I mentioned, sometimes maybe 10, uh, 10 11 inches for a, a large one, and that's a pretty big salamander. Um, these are primarily found uh, in the sand hills, um, in, in some breeding ponds in the sand hills. I think, uh, was it Scotland, Hoke, uh, Richmond, and Moore counties? Uh, Jeff and I talked about yesterday, if you can see my cursor, there is a, uh, an actual circle in Southern Lake County. And I know we have a lot of people from Wake County here um, in today. And Jeff, do you want to mention the status of that? I think it's pretty unclear if that population still exists. Yeah, uh, we, we haven't uh, been able to document animals still using that same uh, area in the last probably 10 years, maybe even 15 years now, uh, unfortunately. Uh, they may still be hanging on, though. These are long lived. So, so one thing we really haven't talked about is, is longevity of salamanders. But many species actually live pretty long lives. Um, and tiger salamanders can certainly live 20 years or longer. So uh, it's possible there's still some adults hanging out in there. But development has not been kind for this species, especially in the Wake County area. And they're probably only hanging on there to begin with. or I mean, not lots of populations there to begin with historically. Uh, so I don't know what the long term situation there is, but uh, it's, it's not particularly rosy. Um, yeah, and, and, and I did want to mention this about diet with these because Jeff had mentioned about uh, some of the earlier uh, species or families. These eat primarily things like earthworms, insects, uh, you know, just about anything small enough that they can fit in their mouths. Well, well, once again, these are very secretive animals, spending a lot of time undercover, underground. Um, but yeah, any kind of uh, beetle larvae, anything like that, are high on these uh, on their diets. Um, as, as I said, unlike the uh, this is like the spotted salamander. They actually lay those gelatinous masses in ephemeral bodies of water. Okay. And I believe the last, uh, and Mr. Madam, the Matatay that we'll talk about is the mole salamander. Remember, all of them as a group are, are commonly named mole salamanders, but we do have a mole salamander species. 
uh, very, very uh, sort of uh, dispersed habitat or at least records. But once again, we talked yesterday uh, and we and every time we do one of these workshops, just because you see these and you say, well, I'm in Iredale or Rowan or, or Davidson, you know, these may be there. There's just not a lot of folks looking for them. And uh, um, so just keep in mind when you see that range map uh, with the salamanders. OK. All right. And the last one, somebody asked in the chat the difference between a a newt and a salamander. All right. Uh, and I said we would get to this. Uh, well, this is the family Salamandra day, and this is the one that's commonly called uh, the newts. There's one species in North Carolina. However, there are two subspecies and they're sort of broken down geographically. You'll see that on the range map. Uh, they do have an aquatic larval stage. Um, and in that larval stage, they, the larva tastes pretty bad and as adults as well. So they can tolerate breeding in, in areas that do have fish in them. I see a lot of these in trout streams. Um, you know, these are, are pretty widespread. They don't have a problem with breeding in where there are fish located. But these are really, really cool animals because, as I said, they all have that aquatic larval stage. But some of them actually come out of the water as a terrestrial subadult. It's called an eft. And uh, uh, this is one of the uh, spotted efts right here. And sometimes they can come out of the water and stay out of the water for maybe one, two, three, maybe seven or eight years before they morph back and go back into water to reproduce. They cannot reproduce in this stage right here. Uh, but sometimes they skip that stage altogether. In other words, the, the, the larva will, will, will morph into an adult and never leave that body of water. Why does that occur? Nobody knows. Now, it's a great way, as far as evolutionarily speaking, to survive drought periods. You know, you say, I'm sitting there and I'm, uh, you know, the pond's drying up. I need to definitely get out of here. And that's a great thing to do. If you can transform into an F, that's fantastic. And I will tell you, in every workshop we talk about this, if I were from, if I had visitors from outer space and they were there and we were at a salamander workshop and you remember at the beginning, Jeff put out, has smooth, slimy skin. These things feel like very fine grit sandpaper and they are, are, are completely terrestrial. In fact, I was in the mountains one time and actually saw maybe a dozen of these just kind of walking around. It wasn't during the heat of the day, but they're all out in the open. You know, uh, in this stage, they are distasteful as well. So you don't have to worry about a lot about predation. But uh, um, but once again, I think uh, we, we saw where a, a either eastern or southern hognose snake actually ingested one of these. And we found the hognose snake and it regurgitated that. So that hognose snake must have been pretty hungry. But these pretty much are distasteful their entire lives. But once again, some of the populations will go back into the bodies of water. And even where you have bodies of water that are permanent, sometimes the Fs do emerge. So nobody really knows that, that craziness life cycle like that. Uh, but it's like uh, going to what I used to call junior high school, skipping high school you know, and then coming back. And in, so it's a really weird life cycle. But as I said, not all populations do that. Um, but we're still trying to figure out why. Hey, Mike. Yes, sir. Uh, someone asked a good question, said, uh, how would naturalists know that a newt never came out of the water? And uh, the way that that may uh, happen is there are certainly projects where people monitor an aquatic wetland uh, using a drift fence, which is basically fencing material all the way around the wetland. And you actually monitor all animals that go in or out of the wetland. And so there are populations that people have done this monitoring and they know that there are newts in there, but they've never left. They have just gone basically from larvae directly into adult stage. You also can look at that uh, based on the size. You can do dip netting in ponds and find uh, large larvae that are just about to uh, turn into adults. But then you know that they, uh, based on other types of surveys, you never find Fs in that area or you never get them in other types of systems. Um, and so uh, that can be an important way to track uh, what's happening with those. But that's how we know that some populations do have that F stage, but some do not have it at all. 
Okay, great question. Uh, the last slide I think I'm going to show you is, is the difference in the subspecies. Uh, once again, they're all eastern newts, but the subspecies you can see on the left-hand side is the spotted newt um, or red spotted newt. And these, these are found primarily everywhere except the southeastern coastal plain. Uh, these are ones you find more statewide. Uh, sometimes they're they're not that bright orange. They may be a little more brown or an olive color, um, sort of like this one. But you can obviously see in the F stage the the spots compared where we have in the in the southeastern coastal plain. The subspecies is called a broken stripe note. And so the F uh, in the, the F stage is pretty easy to tell the difference. But also as adults. This is the broken stripe newt. It's uh, the adult up here in the top right that's found in southeastern North Carolina. And this is the spotted adult newt that's found more across the, the part of North Carolina. Okay. Another question. question. Yeah, okay. question. I, you, you touched on it, I think, but may have uh, passed some of the audience. Um, toxicity? Yes, uh, taste very bad. Um, uh, both the juvenile or the, the, the larva, the F stage and adults, so they can pretty much manage reproducing in fishless and ponds that do have fish in them. Yeah, and that brightly colored stuff is usually uh, used, you know, as a warning to predators: "Don't eat me. I taste bad." And they they are uh, they can be toxic enough to kill things, but usually that toxicity is just distasteful. So a lot of times, uh, animals that are uh, you know have some sort of that warning color are are not deadly to other animals, but distasteful, so that there's some learning going on. So if a raccoon licks one, he goes, oh, you know, he won't try another one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff, I, uh, note to myself, make sure I have the camera on before I share screen. So uh, I'm going to let you take over now. I think uh, uh, there's the Eastern Newt and uh, you're going to do the plethodons. Yep, but you have to release your screen. Yep, going to do that right now. Uh, you do... Okay, and I am lost. Go there we go. Your team there we there. go. All right. Sorry about that. All right. All right. Okay. So back. Uh, so plethodon. Um, this is our plethodon today is the largest family of salamanders in North Carolina and they represent the massive uh, change in salamander species from that 45 to the 60, roughly probably 65 that we have now um, and more to come for sure. Um, but, you know, lots of, of diversity here, lots of different reproductive habits and life cycles among these uh, animals that we're going to be talking about. Um, all of them lack lungs and gills as adults. So this whole group is called sometimes the lungless uh, salamanders. And that is for obvious reason. Uh, but some of them do have larval phases and some of them do not. Uh, they do have that uh, skin respiration as cutaneous respiration as we talked about before. And some do the, through the lining of the mouth as well. Uh, the other thing that uh, you see interesting in this photo here of Weller salamanders that I took on Grandfather Mountain is something called the tail straddling walk. And mo many of the species in the plethodontid family do this, where the male actually is the one in front and the female is following sort of behind. And the male will at some point deposit a spermatophore and the female will actually pick it up and then insert it into her cloaca. So most of these guys have external fertilization. And this tail straddle walk is pretty interesting. It's, it can last over an hour for these two salamanders just following each other around the woods. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty fascinating um, uh, breeding strategy. Uh, there's a lot more we could talk about it, but we'll skip it for now because of time. But it's a pretty, pretty cool thing to learn about. So the first genus we'll mention is Aeneides. Uh, there are two species now in North Carolina, it used to only be one. They are the rock crevice guys, although they also uh, will climb tree trunks. And they're often missed there because people th don't think to look for them there. And they're only in the western part of the state. Uh, our only, our, one of our species is the green salamander. Uh, that is Aeneides aeneas, which is all of these dots like this. And then these couple of dots right here 
is the other salamander, that the other green salamander, which is the hickory nut gorge green salamander. And I don't have photographs of it, but it looks uh, somewhat similar to this animal. Most of us probably couldn't tell the difference, but there are some subtle differences between them. And there are some pretty large pronounced differences genetically between these guys. Uh, these, this is a group that's actually much more speciose in the Western part of the US. Uh, there are multiple species in California and um, uh, Washington and Oregon. And they have these interesting flattened uh, squared toes that seem to be very good at climbing. And all of these salamanders have some sort of arboreal uh, tendencies or uh, behaviors. Uh, the green salamander is threatened in North Carolina, and it's likely that the hickory nut gorge salamander will be recognized as endangered uh, with the very small area that it, that it uh, is found in. Beautiful salamanders. This is the group that has lots and lots of animals in it. Where uh, Jeff, there's lots of, yeah, there, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, before we leave that slide, is the green salamander not a species of federal concern? Uh, the, does include any, the, the, I guess the word document that we put the species, it may not be on there. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of species that periodically get reviewed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for federal listing. This is one that did receive that. Uh, it was petitioned for listing, uh, but the service decided that it was not warranted for listing. Okay. It has no federal designation. Um, so this is the group. Uh, lots of question marks by how many species there are in this thing. This is the one where folks are doing a lot of genetics work on them uh, because they look very, very similar they, uh, among themselves. Now, if you want to distinguish a Desmognathus or a Desmog or a Dusky from all the others, there are a couple characters that can help. One is that they all have this stripe uh, from the eye to the back of the cheek. So you can look for that stripe on the side of their head. And they all have what I call the dragster look, although it's more obvious on some than others, in that their back wheels <laughs> are larger <laughs> than their front wheels. So their back legs are generally larger, thicker, wider than their front legs versus most other salamander species, their front legs and back legs are the same uh, size, generally speaking. So these guys have bigger legs in the back. I forgot I had those in there. <laughs> So here is an amalgam of dusky salamanders, and you can see where people get some difficulties in identifying these. There are some pieces that come into play that can help you distinguish one from another. This is a black belly salamander. This is a southern dusky salamander, a santitla dusky salamander. This is a seal salamander, and this is a northern dusky salamander. But there's tons of variation with these animals. So I could give you an animal that was in the range of the Northern Dusky that might look a lot like this animal here. Um, or I could give you a seal salamander, a larva, or maybe a, a different individual that might look a lot like one of the Northern Duskies, et cetera, et cetera. There are a number of different things where it can be complicated. Uh, sometimes they have a character that helps with them like the black belly salamander. If you get a big adult, uh, it's gonna be bigger than probably any of the other Duskies in that area. But also, as its name suggests, if you catch one and you can look at its belly, it does actually have a dark black belly. Uh, but, you know, you have to have it in hand to be able to identify those sorts of things. I just gave you a, a map, generally speaking, of the northern dusky, southern dusky complex, uh, just to tell you that there are there is some species of dusky basically in every county in the state. And there is a wider diversity of Desmognathus species in the western part of the state. And part of that has to do with geography. So if you look at different parts of the mountains, some species that were at one time considered a single species, such as Desmognathus acrophius, the mountain dusky, it was once called, it was what all of these dots were. But now you'll see that in North Carolina, we don't actually even have a salamander called Desmognathus acrophius anymore. Now we have Desmognathus carolinensis, Orestes, and Acoe, and maybe something else that's not even clear what it is, that purple dot. And if you look at these uh, geographically, you'll find different things that have separated them over periods of time and probably allowed them to speciate into different species. So what defines them as a different species? 
It's that if you take an Orestes and a Carolinensis and you put them together, they don't breed with one another. They don't recognize one another as self. And so that happens even in cases where the salamanders may look very, very similar to one another. Usually there are at least a few morphological differences that we can, that certain people can visualize between them, but they are often very difficult, complicated things. And so it sometimes comes down to biologists in the field having to know where their feet are to figure out which mountain dusky they might be looking at. Um, even though uh, there are people that could also say, oh yeah, that's an Akoe, or no, that's a Carolinensis. That, that uh, is a level of detail that eludes many people. Any questions on the duskies, Mike? Uh, no, sorry, I was muted. You're good to go, Jeff. All right. Uh, so the gen ger genus Eurycia, uh, a number of species in this group, and this is another one that has the potential to increase. Uh, these are often also called creek salamanders, and they usually do have some sort of yellow or bright pigment associated with them, like this one on the right of your screen. And that one is the Chamberlain's dwarf salamander. There are actually two species of dwarf salamander in North Carolina. The other is a species of special concern. Uh, the main difference between them is that the dwarf salamander actually kind of has a silver belly uh, on the underside of it. And um, it uh, is primarily found in the Sand Hills and uh, Carolina Bay areas, whereas the, the rest of the dots on this map, so you would find the dwarf salamander in this sort of area, all the rest of these dots would be Chamberlain's dwarf salamander. So it's a, a much more widespread, more common animal. And both of these photographs are of Chamberlain's dwarf salamanders. The, the specific epithet of the dwarf salamander is helpful though, quadradigitata, meaning that it has four digits. So most salamanders in the Plethodontidae family have four toes on the front feet and five toes on the back feet but not the case with this animal and one other that we'll see uh, shortly later on. Uh, so this guy actually has four toes on the front and four toes on the back. And that's for both species, the Chamberlain's dwarf and the regular dwarf. It is our smallest salamander uh, or one of our smallest salamanders. It's not the smallest. We have the pygmy salamander that gets a little bit smaller, uh, two species of pygmy in the mountains. In the coastal plain, this is our smallest salamander for sure. So the uh, two-line salamanders are broken up into a whole bunch of different species now, and some of them are very obviously different from one another, and some of them are less so. Uh, the top two photos are actually of the southern two-line salamander, which occurs throughout most of the central <coughs> Piedmont uh, and coastal plain of the state. When you get into the extreme western part of the state, you'll actually get into Eurycia wildery or the Blue Ridge two-line salamander. And in the Sandhills area, you get this funny looking animal, which is sort of reddish orangish and doesn't really have the stripes like you see on the other two-line salamanders, but it is in that same group. And uh, it's found uh, primarily in the Sandhills area. However, you can also find this guy, Eurycia cerigera, in that area. So most of these dots that you're seeing here are actually the southern two-line salamander, not the sandhill salamander. Lots of people who go and flip rocks and creeks find the larvae of two-line salamanders. They are often very obvious. Uh, they have a relatively long larval period. Um, and so you might find a larva of a two-line salamander anywhere from about half an inch long up to almost maybe two inches long, maybe two and a half inches long, uh, there'll still be a larva. So they are pretty much present in most streams that have two-line salamanders in the area. You can probably find two-line two salamander larvae. It's probably the most common photo that someone sends me and wants to know what kind of salamander it is. It's almost always one of the two-line species. Now I could tell you, I could not tell you from just a larval picture if this was a Blue Ridge two-lined, a Southern two-lined, or a Sandhills Eurycia. They all look very, very similar. Uh, I don't know about identical, but very, very similar. Um, one thing that sometimes you'll see, there are different types of morphs within the two-lined salamander. There's one that's called the Morph A, and the Morph A actually has a really big head and it the, on the male. And so you might find a male that has a really big head. And if it has a bigger head than the others, you know it's a male. The other thing that you might have is a normal shaped head 
but it will have these elongate teeth. Uh, they're, they're not really teeth, they're called Siri, uh, little projections un underneath uh, the, the underside of the lip. You can kind of see them on this animal as well. So these are both males and they actually cover uh, some teeth that actually stick through the jaw that they use to in, in courtship uh, pro processes with females. Um, and so that's a, a pretty interesting uh, breeding strategy, uh, but I'm not gonna go into it a whole lot more detail. Mike, uh, it sounded like you were wanting to ask a question perhaps. Uh, yeah, Krista asks, is there a trick to determine a larval salamander and one that has external gills as an adult? Yeah, it really comes down to size, time of year, and some things like that. Most of the species that have larvae that turn into adults, the larvae are small. So they're generally just a couple inches, maybe three inches long. You get some exceptions with things like mud and red salamanders, which we'll get to in a moment, that have larger larvae that could be confused with something like a dwarf mud puppy or something like that. But generally speaking, all the animals that retain the larval characteristics are larger as adults. Now, you can be in a coastal stream in North Carolina and find a juvenile mud puppy that will be the same size as a juvenile or a, a larval two-line salamander. And then it gets very complicated. So larval identification of salamanders can be tricky, no doubt. Good question. All right, here's another Eurycia, the three-line salamander. This one has a fairly wide distribution across the state, but is mostly absent from the coastal plain. Uh, a nice uh, uh, large-ish salamander uh, that uh, really nice, boldly colored. These are always uh, fun to find in different types of wetlands. A different genus, Gyronophilus. We only have one species in this genus. Uh, it has sometimes this cave form that's get, it's real elongate and real narrow. Uh, this one's actually in uh, Linville Caverns. Um, and uh, again, one species. And uh, these guys are kind of interesting. They do uh, specialize in eating other salamanders. That's their primary preferred prey. And you often find them out on wet, rainy nights and they're out looking for other salamanders to eat. Uh, they have a very long larval period, and so it's often common to find their larva, this is one here, uh, in streams nearby where it may be much tougher to actually find one of these beautiful, brightly colored adults. Um, so you just kind of have to spend some time around smaller creeks and springs uh, in the western part of the state, flip enough logs, and, and you may get lucky enough to find a spring. Although the best way that I've found adult spring salamanders is, again, out at night, uh, walking trails or uh, even driving roads in areas with low traffic, uh, looking for these guys out on the prowl. The genus Hemidactylium, another one with just one species. This is the other species along with the dwarf salamander that only has four toes on its back uh, foot. Uh, so it has four in the front and four on the back as well. You would not confuse it with a dwarf salamander though, because it looks uh, quite different. Uh, it is found basically across the state, but its uh, primary distribution is sort of Piedmont and Western. Um, it has this basal constriction right at the base of the tail uh, that helps distinguish it from some a lot of other species. Uh, but also, if you happen to get one in your hand, uh, they look very different on the belly. This whitish cream color with these little uh, black splotches all along the sides. Uh, so a fairly uniquely colored individual. Okay, the genus Pseudotriton has two species in North Carolina. They do look very similar. They both have very long larval periods. So that's similar to some of the species we've talked about already. If you're in an area that has either mud or red salamanders, if you're in the right creek or seepagey kind of flowing type of place, uh, you're going to find their larva if you look if you look uh, hard enough. And there's one in a bag in my hand. So just for scale, you can see that one is probably about three inches long, three and a half inches long. So one of those two species is the mud salamander. Uh, it, it can be orangey or red or really old individuals may be almost this purpley color like you see in the upper left. That just generally tells you it's a very old adult. Uh, statewide distribution although they are not as commonly encountered uh, perhaps as the red salamander is in other parts of the range. 
Uh, the mud is found across the state. The, the red is really mostly absent from the coastal plain, which we'll see in just a second. So the mud salamander, the dots that are on it look like you you made them intentionally, so they're not quite as as uh, specific, or, or they do look specific, like maybe you took a Sharpie and made them. On the red salamander, it's more like you flicked the paint on there and the spots are not quite as, as uh, specific. Also, with the red salamander, it has yellowish eyes and the mud salamander has black eyes. So if we put them side by side, uh, you have the mud salamander on the top and the red salamander on the bottom. Stereochylus, another one with one species. Um, it's, a, it's a largely underseen <laughs> species. Uh, it looks a lot like a lot of the Desmognathus, although notice it does not have that stripe from the eye to the back of the angle of the jaw. Uh, so that is, looks a little different. Um, it does have these lines that go along the side of its body. They give it its name, the mini line salamander. It is another one that has a long larval period, and it does have those lines along the side of the larva. So if you're looking for the species in a seep or a creek type situation, uh, you may turn it up as a larval form more readily than an adult, as you see on the top there. Okay, and then the final genus we'll talk about today is Plethodon. This one has lots of species in North Carolina. They're the ones that are often called woodland because they really do travel a long way from water. And that's because they have direct development. So in this photo that you see there, you have two slimy salamanders. And this one is obviously an adult. These are Atlantic Coast slimy salamanders. And this is a relatively fresh uh, hatchling. It's probably actually maybe as much as a year old. Uh, but uh, they look just like tiny versions of the adults when they hatch out of the egg, and there is no larval stage whatsoever for any of the genus Plethodon. Uh, we have used a lot of DNA recently, as we have with many of the Desmognathus, uh, to help identify different species in these groups. So here's the slimy salamander group, at one time called all called Plethodon glutinosus. Now there are actually three different, at least three different slimy salamanders. Uh, if you include some of the um, newer ones, there's actually as many as five slimy salamanders in North Carolina. But the ones that are most commonly encountered by folks are this one, the Atlantic Coast slimy, excuse me, um, yeah, the white spotted slimy salamander, which is Plethodon cylindraceus, or these two, which are Plethodon chlorobryonis that are found on the coastal plain of, of North Carolina. So in the Piedmont, you may see them that looks something like either one of these. And then in the mountain region, you're generally going to find them looking like this. Although any of the ones across this whole range of the slimy, because of that V word, variability, you may get ones in the mountains that look somewhat like this. And occasionally in the coast, you may get one that looks like this or has a lot of white on it. I don't know about this much white. That's a lot of white uh, for, for a coastal plain animal. But you get the general idea. Redbacks uh, are the one that uh, I mentioned before, greatest amount of biomass. This is a curious species because it has this weird distribution. So you can found it, find it in the upper northeast coastal plain and then a few spots in the, other, in, in the rest of the coastal plain. In fact, even in my hometown of Greenville, I can find them. Uh, then there's this Piedmont area where they can be found and then their mountain distribution. So it's a really sort of strange thing. You know, why is there nothing in between? Uh, it's hard to know exactly. Uh, is it a relic from former ice ages and receding of glaciers and they re re remained in certain areas and not in others. Uh, it's hard to know. It's a really uh, curious critter. It does come in two color forms. All of these are the red back phase, but there's another one that will be, it actually sort of has a dark uh, gray back. And so we refer to that as the lead back phase of the red back salamander. And then this is one that uh, has been has changed significantly in the last 10 years, uh, the Jordan salamander. Uh, once all recognized as one species, Plethodon jordani, this is one that pretty readily uh, is easy to uh, understand why these really aren't the same species. Uh, you have actual jordani, which is the red-cheeked salamander. Uh, then you have red-legged salamander, Plethodon shermani, which is these orangey dots, Plethodon chioa, uh, here in the yellow dots. And then these other four species all basically are some form of uh, gray cheeked salamander that look a lot like this. Um, so if you're talking about what these things look like, 
all of these gray cheeked looks a lot like Plethodon montanus um, or the um, northern gray cheeked salamander. And then you have Plethodon chioa that looks a lot like the red legged salamander. The red on its legs are slightly reduced than what you see on Plethodon shermani, but really, really similar looking. So this is another one. If you have any of these ones on, on the right, you kind of have to figure out where you are on planet Earth to help you distinguish them because they all look very similar. Uh, although I would argue that, that South Mountain's gray cheek salamander, Plethodon meridianus, looks more different than the others. And our last salamander for today, one of my favorites, the Plethodon yonalasi, yonalasi salamander, actually named for the yonalasi road that uh, is around the Boone area, but it's an absolutely beautiful salamander. Uh, lots of white flecking on the head, and of course that beautiful uh, reddish brick colored red down the back of the salamander. And it's a, a decent sized animal as well, you know, maybe six, seven, even eight inches long, not quite that long probably, but uh, it does get to be a, a nice sized salamander. So pretty neat critter. So what can you do? Actually, quickly, Mike, any uh, quick questions on uh, any species lately? Otherwise, no, no, I'll, no. I'll finish up. There's a few questions, but we'll just wait till the end because we're, we're sort of time limited. So Yeah, okay. Yeah, so what can you do? Uh, we've talked a bit about Hurt Mapper. Uh, you can certainly go around and uh, find observations, record them there, and then that's one way that you can help uh, us learn more about salamanders. Um, you can not collect them from the wild. Uh, that certainly can reduce populations. Uh, you can make habitats in your own yard to attract salamanders. Um, and you can learn more about the ones that are in your area and spread the word. Uh, herpsofnc.org, we mentioned this already, but it's great for learning about your salamanders in the state. And we'll take questions. Okay, yeah, uh, Jeff, we have a few there, but uh, one of the questions is uh, dealing with field guides, which I'll get to in just a second, but I forgot to mention this earlier. So, uh, those of you that are interested in getting uh, the Office of Environmental Education certification, uh, this is available for an hour and a half for Criteria 3. At the end of the, uh, the event today, if you could just send me an email saying that you need it, hopefully I can get to it this week, but I will send you a copy of the, uh, used to be called Form B, uh, but I'll send you the OE form uh, that showed that you participated in this. OK, just send me an email and please do not put it in the chat. Just send me that email that uh, uh, you should still have that email from me about how to register for the workshop. Jeff, one of the questions was, um, uh, what's the best field guide for North Carolina? Well, this Great is the segue. one. Yeah, good segue. This is probably one that everybody uh, may be familiar with. It's uh, obviously faded, but this was uh, published in 1980 by Martoff and some others, a lot of them with the museum. And this was this, this was fantastic. It was all North and South Carolina and Virginia based. It had range maps, it had nice photographs of the, and it had the life history, and it was all just North Carolina. Well, that was in 1980. Um, Carolinas and Virginia, yeah. I'm sorry, Carolinas and Virginia. And I do not remember the uh, one that came between that. And Jeff, I think you said there was a cricket or a uh, uh, little, little grass ball. Yeah. There was another version, which I do not have, that some of you may have laying around. There was the same text. It was just a different cover. It was still published in 1980. However, in 2010, Jeff Dean kind of took the ball he, from the museum and created this. This was uh, uh, updated up until 2010, had the updated range maps. It even had some of the, uh, um, well, here's the Jordan complex that Jeff was mentioning. You can see all, I don't know if you can see all the different colors, uh, but this was published in 2010. So this is the latest cover. However, as we've been talking about that, a lot of this information is already, you know, not out of date, but, you know, maybe some different ranges and actually new species. So those are particular with the Carolinas and Virginia. However, yeah, if, you haven't, if you haven't updated your 1980 one, you definitely want the 2010 one. There's lots of updates. Exactly. And that will be very, very helpful. Another one that's, uh, it's, uh, this is North American Reptiles and Amphibians. This is Audubon. I love Audubon. They're a great group of people, um, the whole organization, the volunteers, the members. Uh, unfortunately, they have pictures, and I know pictures are really, really good. Um, uh, you know, it, sometimes they're the best pictures of that particular species, but for me, 
it's hard, especially Jeff's talking about costal grooves and and that white line on the on the desmogs between the uh, the uh, uh, the lip and the eye. Uh, I think one of the better ones is obviously Peterson's because Peterson's they get a lot more detail. Uh, once again, it's it's uh, all across the uh, North America, but rep, or excuse me, this is Eastern North America. Um, but they actually have some plates in there. Like for instance, here's the. I think this is obviously out of date because they have the Mountain Dusky there, and you can see they're all called Mountain Duskies, but they're just three species. But that's a little. I, I'm sure they they've updated this, but uh, remember things are changing in a hurry with salamanders. Also, Jeff, I saw in the chat where you talked about Petranka. If you are a salamander guru and you want to know everything about breeding, identifying larva, um, you know, life, uh, uh, you know, diets, things like that, this is fantastic. Unfortunately, unlike the reptiles of North Carolina, this is all United States and Canada. It's got a ton of information, but there's a lot of species in here that uh, that we do not have in North Carolina. But this is sort of the one I think Jeff was mentioning as a companion to, hang on just a second, to this one where it had reptiles of North Carolina. I think Jeff mentioned that some of those range maps may be published if they come up with some amphibians of North Carolina, or at least salamanders of North Carolina. So I hope that answers the question uh, about field guides. Uh, we're just about out of time, so um, you're, we're going to, we, we're going to hang on. I don't have anything else until two o'clock. Um, and if you're more than welcome to stay on, if there's, I think there's still 60 people online right now, you know, if, if people start to drop off, we can actually, we can get you to cut your camera on and microphone and you can ask us a question personally, but, uh, there's some great questions in here, but I do not want to yeah. hold everybody up, um, that needs to check out, um, Jeff, anything that else you want to say? I mean, we're still we're not closing off, but I know some of you probably need to go. Uh, anything, Jeff? That you I, want to yeah, I, I did a pause there so I can we can uh, edit the recording later if we want. I'm going to keep it going because uh, questions might be good to have. We'll, we'll we'll make that decision later. So somebody asked, uh, "Is there a trick?" Oh, we talked about that one. Is the what's the best way to handle a salamander for its safety and health? That's a great question. Uh, certainly, one important thing is to make sure your hands are wet. So salamanders, again, have those wet, moist, slimy skins. If your hands are dry and you're handling a salamander, you're going to hurt them. Uh, so make sure your hands are at least a little bit wet. If you have the, the potential, if you're going to be handling more than one, it might even be best to use something like uh, uh, nitrile gloves, plastic gloves, uh, so that you uh, don't transfer anything to that salamander. Uh, if you've already, if you've recently put on bug spray or sunscreen, you really don't want to handle them because again, whatever you have on your hands is going to be passed on to that animal. Uh, but generally speaking, I'll just make my hands moist and then you can handle that animal uh, gently and then return it back to the site where you find it. Um, somebody asked, can monitoring marbled salamanders have a negative effect on <laughs> those guarding eggs? Uh, generally speaking, no. So if you roll a log, and you find a female that's guarding eggs, as long as you gently sort of roll that log back, or you may have to do something else, you may have to um, uh, displace the female uh, for a moment, roll the log back, and then let her go back under, because you don't want to squish her. But as long as you can put that back, uh, then, then she'll, she'll go back to those eggs and she'll guard them. That shouldn't mess them up too badly. Um, so yeah, you, you just have to be careful about trying to get the materials back as well as you can to what they were beforehand. Sometimes people use artificial cover boards like wood, pieces of wood, and you flip up a piece of wood and there's a marbled salamander with eggs under there. You know, you can lay that piece of wood right back down and you don't harm them at all. You don't disturb the materials, things like that. So that might be uh, one thing you could choose. Uh, how can you make a habitat without attracting more mosquitoes? Uh, that can be tough. Um, Generally speaking, if you have a pond that's operating under normal parameters, it actually will generate enough aquatic insects and um, uh, tadpoles and larvae of salamanders that that won't be a problem. But it takes time for that to develop. So if you create a pond in your backyard, uh, you may have some period of time at the beginning uh, where you have to deal with that and have to figure out how to how to you know, counteract the mosquitoes. 
But over time, it should become a pond that is more regulated, I guess you would say, uh, with, with cycles of uh, predator and prey in the same system. Jeff, while you're talking about that, uh, and I should have checked with you before we did this, do you, is that link still available where you, you created, you and NC State, uh, attracting amphibians to your backyard? Do you think I can send them that link? Yeah, that'd be great. Yes, there is a there is a NC State publication that I helped with, and uh, yes, yeah, so that'd be a good one to to stick in there. Okay. Um, I'm seeing things from Jamie. I'm not sure. Now, remember, my camera was off, uh, yeah. but I'm not sure about that with the technical questions. Um, but the other so one, from a, Jamie, yeah, I well, I, yeah, I don't know how to answer the technical stuff. Sorry about that, Jamie. Uh, somebody says, is there a way to protect, relocate, rescue species from areas being developed? You know, and, and you mentioned the Piedmont. Of course, development is all across the state. Uh, that is an issue that we wrestle with all the time, but there's really not a way to do that particularly uh, helpfully. Um, the problem is that there's always animals living somewhere else. So if you take the animals from a forest and you put them in the forest next to them, already animals there. Uh, one general biological principle is that areas uh, uh, um, operate at carrying capacity. So it's already got as many animals as would normally be able to live there. Sometimes we do, we take extra measures if they are listed species or those species that are in severe decline. Um, but most of like tiger salamanders might be a good example. We have some cases where we've looked at maybe head starting of tiger salamanders, or if we knew of a tiger salamander pond that was gonna be destroyed and there was nothing we could do to change that, uh, we might move tiger egg masses out of that pond and into another one. But unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult to deal with it otherwise because you, you get into issues of taking the animals somewhere else and uh, all sorts of things. So uh, that's, that's it's just a tough, tough deal. There's really not a whole lot you can do about it. All right, Jane had asked, how do you explain seeing an F very far away from a body of water? Would it be a very long walk for the return? Remember, these things can be terrestrial for one, two, three, four, seven, eight years. So in that period of time, they can travel long distances. I mean, they remember, they have very dry skin. They can tolerate very dry environments. So, uh, uh, you know, it's it's not like they needed to be really, really close to something because they, they can spend a lot of time in that in that F terrestrial stage. Yeah, and we didn't mention it a whole lot, but yeah, like you just said, when they go into that F stage, their skin does change texture a little bit, and they become more rough and warty looking, um, more toad-like in their skin, or even lizard-like. Um, I was once with a contractor, and we found an F, and I showed it to him, and he was like, oh, that's cool, and, and he took it, and he actually tried to place it on a tree, and I was like, what are, you, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm letting the lizard go. I'm like, no, that's not a lizard. So, I mean, you can um, uh, get confused because of how their skin is, but it's so dry that they can tolerate long distances away from water. And I mentioned when we were talking about it, it feels like 200 grit fine sandpaper. I mean, the finest <laughs> sandpaper you can find. So That's right. Um, are you All scrolling? Right, we'll keep going, but I'm just going to say uh, thank you, everyone, for joining the workshop, and I'm going to stop the recording now.